Welcome to our channel. Hello. Hello. If you enjoy learning about reptiles and having a good laugh, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. Hit. Smash it. Smash. Smash it. Smash it right now. And don't forget to hit that notification bell. Hit. Smash. Smash it. Smash. Okay. Smash. Before we get started, everybody, I want to say a big thank you to Jeff Von Rohn. I mean, Jeff Rohn. He is the one that I got most of my information from. He likes to breed the boas without having to drop the temperatures. And this is so nice. When you are dropping the temperatures, it is easy for the snakes to get sick. Maybe not if you live down south, but here in Canada, it gets very cold, not as cold as in the motherland, of course, but it still gets cold. So we naturally have the temperature drop. So we don't want to be messing too much with the temperatures. Maybe have a respiratory infection or catch a cold. And when the snake has these problems, they don't recover always so easy. It can kill the snake and we don't want any of that. I want you to think about this, okay? Just because you have a snake doesn't mean you have to breed it. I know it's so tempting. I wanted to make baby snakes too. But even when I started, I only did one. I made sure is this right for me because it may not be right for you. Maybe you like the snakes, but you don't like people. And if you don't like people, you're not going to be able to sell your snakes to people. You have to think when you are breeding the snakes, maybe like the ball python, when they are young, you get maybe four or five eggs, maybe six. But it's easy to sell and take care of maybe six snakes if they don't sell. When we are breeding the boars, we can get anywhere from six, I never have six, maybe smallest litter was like 15. When you are breeding the boars, you could have anywhere like 30 or more babies. So it's very, you have to understand, you are going to be responsible. You have to be able to take care of the babies and make sure they are eating properly before you can sell them. And do you know the people that are going to buy them or are you going to just be taking them to the pet shop and selling them for $30? Because this is not a smart idea. Why put yourself through all that trouble and the snake through so much trouble if you are just going to be giving them away? No, you have to have respect for yourself. You have to put, you say, you know, I put the work into it and now I'm going to have the babies. I'm going to make sure I take very good care of them. I'm going to make sure they are eating properly. And then once they are doing all that very well, then I say, hi, hi, Heidi, hi, Fraulein, hi, everybody, hi, all my friends. Do you know snakes are very good pets? You should get one from me. That is how we sell the snakes to everybody. So before, I cannot stress enough, before you start to breed the snakes, you have to make sure you like the peoples. You have to make sure maybe you are good with the camera. You have to take nice pictures of all the snakes and say, hi, little noodle. This is my little noodle, it's so cute. You have to buy it and then you put maybe on the website. Are you ready to do all those things? Are you going to post on Kijiji? Are you going to put it on Facebook? I don't think we can sell on Facebook no more. So you have to tell yourself, am I going to do all these things? Am I going to be able to have the housing to put the babies in houses? Am I going to have the money to feed them? Am I going to have the time? The time is sometimes what takes even longer. Are you ready to every night be sitting down on a bucket with your little tongues trying to get your snakes to eat? Are you ready for that? Because if you're not, maybe you don't want to breed the boas. Maybe it's much better for you to just enjoy forever as a nice pet, or at least like 20, 30 years. Now we are going to show you some snakes a bit. This is Sahara. She is the first snake I ever breed, okay? And if you look at her right now, she is thin. She uh, produced babies again this year for me. And she is my largest boa. Now, when you are working with a big boa, it takes more long time for her to recover because she big, she produced many babies. When 
I first breed her maybe six years ago. Now she breed this year, and now I don't want to breed her anymore. Now lots of people, they breed their snake over, over, over again, keep it for a long time. Maybe it's better to breed your snake a few times and then retire. And now I want her to go to somebody who wants to keep her as a pet and just have very good time and not be breeding her like crazy till she die. Now I'm not saying that if you breed your snake a lot, they're going to die. But every time you breed them, you risk that. I believe in breeding the snake a few times and then giving them to a good family to take care of them. That is good for them. <laughs> she still not has recovered her body weight. She still needs to eat more. And I feed her nice meals, but it takes time for her to get back to the size that she should be. This is Aphrodite. She breed this year and she make the sterling snakes, very beautiful snakes. So she has had the most healthy litter I ever have. And I don't, now I'm going English, so I now don't know. I can't do German anymore. We're gonna switch it up. We're gonna go English, okay? So Aphrodite had the most beautiful litter of snakes I've ever had. They were all in perfect condition. And it was delightful, I loved it. And like, when you look at her, she's already recovered her body weight back. She's not fat or anything, she's just perfect. It's like, this is how you want a snake to look. So when Sahara had babies, it takes a much larger toll on her body than when Aphrodite does. So you see Aphrodite, she's perfect. And if I wanted to, do, I could probably breed her again this coming season. And I want to slow down, refocus on my projects, downsize my collection, and just Focus on breeding a little bit less and a little bit more quality. So that's that's what we have to think about. And that doesn't mean she's not good quality. It just means instead of getting babies out of her this year, I'd rather her go another year without babies and then the year after that, she's going to be larger and produce like something very phenomenal. We're going to get a lot more sterlings, which would be wonderful. And now over here we have Luna, and I love Luna. Luna is fabulous, she's a moon glow. Of course I want to breed her, but is she ready to breed? No, she's too small. So am I going to breed her? No, absolutely not. <laughs> but I just want to show you, this is too small. We don't breed boas uh, this size. She's got a little bit of extra meat on her. I'm trying to grow her nicely. I'm feeding her every two weeks, small meals, but I'm just taking my time with her. When she's ready to breed, we're gonna do it. It's gonna be wonderful. When I was first starting, people used to say uh, three, four years. You can breed them when they're three, but sometimes it's better to wait till they're four. And <laughs> with me, I can't remember anything. You think I know the birthday of all my snakes? Am I a terrible breeder for not knowing? No. Do I weigh my snakes? I don't weigh any of my snakes. I don't write down the birthday. I don't do anything like that. I pay attention to them. I look at them and I say, wow, you know, this one is ready now or this one is not. And I base that off of them, off their bodies, off looking at them. Not by, oh, they're this year, they're this old, oh, I have to wait another year. Or, oh, no, I can't do it right now. I don't do any of that, okay? But right now, people are saying, wait four to five years. And to me, I think, imagine you're like, okay, I'm going to wait five years. I want to do what's best for my snake. And then you keep it for five years and then it doesn't breed for you. Then what? It's so like, I just... I spent five years waiting, now it's ready and it's not ready. So sometimes with animals, another thing that happens, and this might be total nonsense, okay? But so it, it happens with leopard geckos where they get a certain weight, they're ready to breed. And if you don't breed them, then later on, they may not want to breed. So I don't know if it happens like that with snakes, but I really feel the animal gets to a point where they're ready to reproduce. And when they're ready to reproduce, then we try to breed them. And when they're not ready to reproduce, then we leave them alone. But I really have a hard time with all these rules. Like, okay, we have to do it like this, and this is the way we have to do it, because there's all sorts of different ways. Now, I'm not saying it's okay to take a snake and say, I'm gonna feed it and feed it, I'm gonna feed it every week, I'm gonna get it super large, and I'm gonna breed it when it's two years old. I'm not saying to do that, that's not right. I'm saying let's go about things more naturally. Let's just take our time, feed it a healthy way that is growing nice and healthy and we're doing good. 
this is Leia, and Leia is, once again, I'm so terrible, I don't know how old my snakes are, because I, <laughs> I don't write it down, you know what I do, I take pictures of them, and then if I really need to know how old they are, I go on my Instagram, I'm like, okay, that's when they were born, All right. I look at my YouTube, I'm like, oh, I posted the litter, that's when they were born. But I want you to look at her size and her weight and everything. And I, I want you to know that I fed her a lot less. I fed her like on one of those silly schedules where people say, feed your snake every four weeks or every five weeks and all that. And the way she grew, she grew okay, but I just felt like it wasn't that healthy for her. I didn't feel like she was in the best condition. Now I feel like she's doing a lot better because I, I feed her the way I feed all my other snakes. Now this over here, this is, this is Nova. Nova is my favorite boa. She's, a, she's from my first litter. So she's probably like, uh, she's like four or five, she's probably like four or five years old. Nova is Leia's sister. Can you, can you see the difference in size? And when you, when you look at, when you look at Nova, this is, to me, that's perfect. She bred for me this year, and she's recovered, and she looks perfect. And to me, a snake this size is a good size for breeding. I don't really want them to be as big as Sahara, because it takes a lot more for them to recover. It takes a lot longer. And over time, watching your snake and learning to feed them properly can help you control their size. It doesn't mean you're starving them. It doesn't mean that you're overfeeding them. It means that you're watching your snake and you, you, you're not just thinking about making babies. Oh, I'm going to feed it as much as I can and make it big and just have a whole pile of babies because I want lots of babies and lots of money and all that. But we're going to feed it in a way that is nice and just maintain a beautiful, perfect snake that's going to produce nice and healthy litters for me. Now I could take her and breed her again, but I don't want to. What I'm going to do is with my boas, I breed them, I give them a year off, and then I try breeding them the next year. So I can breed them every second year, maybe every third year, depending on what I feel like doing. But depending on looking at the snake and being like, this is beautiful, it's perfect, it's ready, let's do it. Let's be nice and healthy, and ready to produce. And then it will. And if it isn't, then it probably won't even produce. Or it might, but it's not good for it. We want to do what's best for the snake, not what's best for us or what we think is right. If the, if the snake is in good condition, it's a good age, it's good weight, and it all got there naturally, or like the way that you did it, you know, you did it in a balanced way, then good for it, go. And if it didn't, then wait. But Leia was fed based on one of those charts and Nova was fed my way. And I, I think that Nova is much healthier and in better condition than Leia is, even though she's been bred and she's not fat. She's perfect. She's not round. She's like a nice, fresh piece of toast. <laughs> this is Sophie, and Sophie is the perfect size. She's even bigger than she needs to be, but Sophie I've had for a very long time. I've had Sophie for a very long time. Sophie is my uh, second, I think she's my second boa. And uh, <laughs> I originally bought a Hog Island boa, Selkuth, and I bought Sophie and I was just like, oh, I'm gonna make albino Hog Island boas. Cause I didn't understand how localities and morphs worked and genes and all that stuff. So if you don't either and you want to learn about that stuff, tell me, I'll make some gene videos. But basically my original breeding plans were totally off. If I would have bred Sophie to Selkuth, I wouldn't have had any albino babies. So I decided not to and I just ended up keeping them as pets. All I thought to myself was I'm going to pick up two beautiful animals, I'm going to put them together and get a, I'm going to get like a mixture. I'm going to get some that look like him, some that look like her, but that's not how breeding works. But this is not a genetic video. This is a breeding video. So let's get back on topic. So Sophie here has never been bred. I tried to breed her last year, but it didn't work out this year. She is, you know, she's perfect. She's probably, I think she's in the 
like best condition for breeding out of all the snakes I've ever bred. Like she's just, she's so strong. She's a good size and I'll be able to put her to something that'll actually produce albinos and I'll get to test to see if she's het for anery because I think she is het for anery because she doesn't have very much red, but you gotta prove all these things out and figure all that stuff out. The main thing that I want to mention is that before it was said, you know, three to four years, now it's being said four to five years. And I'm saying, take all those numbers, take the weights, take all that stuff, throw it in the garbage. Either it's the right size to breed or it isn't. And that might be at three years old. And that might be at five years old. Uh, just feed your snake properly. Feed it in a way that it's growing at a nice pace. Watch its body tone. And then when the snake gets to the weight and size where it's ready to breed, then if you're ready and you want to, then go for it. But even more important than breeding your snake is everything that's going to come after. Think about what's going to come after. You're going to have to take care of all them. You'll be surprised, but the other thing that you need to have, you have to have a male and a female. Because two males are not going to make babies, and two females are not going to make babies either. So you need a male and a female. And if you don't know how to sex them, I make video for you. I already have it. You search in my videos, you find how to do it, okay? <laughs> okay. This is what happens when I have a day home alone without my wife or baby. I just go nuts. <laughs> I'm showing you the real me. Your true colors, that's why I love you. Okay. I start meddling and messing with things in August, okay? So, in the middle of August, we're already too late, and it's like, I should have made this video before, but I didn't because I'm waiting for a new camera because I want to have crisp 4K for you. Congratulations for the Huawei Femme that takes good video so that you may see this. But it's going to be even better when my new camera comes. In the middle of August is when I stop feeding my males. This is Poa the Boa. He is the OG of my male boas. He's my first big male boa and I bought him and he was a little bit smaller than this, but he's kind of maintained his size. He's in shed right now, so it doesn't look the prettiest, but he is an anery het albino. And uh, he's basically the father to lots of the babies in the past. So if you have a baby from the past, it's probably from him. But my male boas don't get this big anymore because, well, I got him already bigger. So he is a great breeder, he does the job. Now I have, I have snakes that just have a lot more genes, so, I don't want to go and breed him anymore because it's just like, what's the point of making more snakes that are just not as fancy if I can be making a lot fancier babies. Sometimes he pushes, he likes to just shove his face against you sometimes and he doesn't mean to, but then his teeth, I think he just scratched my neck a bit. So he's not trying to hurt me or anything. He just he caught a tooth on my neck. Like, what do I want to go and produce a whole pile of couple hundred dollar snakes if I could produce a lot more expensive snakes? So I think it's a lot better to produce less snakes that are more expensive than a pile of snakes that are cheap. Because even though snakes are cheap, sell faster, you're just, you're producing a whole pile that you don't need to. So Poe is another one that's kind of retired. He's a pet and a wonderful snake. If you're in Canada and looking for a great animal, Poe would make a wonderful pet but he's just, I'm not breeding him anymore. Uh, this is a perfect size for breeding male. He is, I think three years old. Nico is a Moonglow IMG, I hope, I think so. We still have to wait and see because our breedings this year were not super great. And I don't know if it was because of the temperatures with the babies, like, I don't know if it was because of the albino to albino, and I don't know if it was just maybe he was young and his sperm wasn't as viable. Who knows? If, if you think you know, let me know. Very hyper. Okay. Let's get back on topic. In the middle of August, I will usually give my males a nice big meal. So Nico just had a nice big meal there, and that's going to be his last meal for a while. So we kind of let the males go without food for a while so that they are hungry because like when they're hungry they're gonna be in the mood more like hey i want to do it 
I want to do it now. Hey, baby, I'm hungry. Come over here. And this is this is how we want our snakes to feel. We want them to be in the mood. We want them to be like, hey, mommy, come over here. I'm ready to make babies. But even though Charles seems simple, his last name is Xavier. So don't mess with him, okay? Anyway, so Charles here and Nico are beautiful size males for breeding. They're not too small. They're not too big. They're nice and lean and ready to go. Okay, I'll show you one more. And Ty is another one of my male breeders and he does a wonderful job. So when you look at the size of Power, that's kind of pushing it a bit far. And if you look at the size of Nico and Charles and Ty over here, these are the perfect size. These are great size male breeders. They're not too young, they're nice, they're a good size, they're lean, and they're gonna get the job done. So that's, that's what you want. You want a snake kind of like this. So in August, middle of August, or for me, I'm running a bit late. I've been so busy with so many things. So give our males a nice big meal in the middle of August to the end of August. Like around the same time, we're gonna start feeding the females a little bit heavier. So I was feeding them every three weeks, a large rat. Maybe I'll feed them every two weeks, a large rat, or I'll feed them every three weeks, an extra large rat. Like uh, I'll change it up, whatever I feel like doing. Once again, I'm looking at their bodies. I'm saying, okay, she's looking a little thin. I gotta get her a little bit chunkier. I don't wanna make her fat, but I just wanna make her gain a bit of weight. So we can do that in a couple months. So like August, September, now you can, you know, if your females are looking a little too lean, feed them a little bit more. If they're looking perfect, just feed them just a touch more. Look at their bodies and decide. You know, if, if you looked at all of the females that I showed you, uh, the yellow one to me, looked in the most prime condition to breed, and that's Sophie. Uh, she hasn't been bred. She's got a lot more weight on her than he does. You, like, you don't really want to breed a female that looks like this. You want to breed a female that is a nice, full-bodied female. <laughs> and that doesn't mean she has to be huge. She can be the same length as Ty here, but just nice, you know, a nice round fullness. I, I don't know how better to Describe it. We want her to look nice, you know, we want a little bit of me. We want to be like, yeah, baby We want Ty to go in there and be like he doesn't want to feel like he's with another male He wants to go in there and be like, hey, baby, come over here <laughs> Very good. This is going to be the best breeding video you've ever seen So much fun. So exciting. Okay <laughs> Maybe this is gonna be the video that makes my my channel blow up and then yeah, then maybe we can get a warehouse and turn it into a zoo. No, I don't actually want to do that, okay? I want to live my life and be with my familia. <sighs> it's so hard for me. I made these these cards so I can, like, I never do this, okay? I never follow a script, but today I'm following a script for you because we got to get this done. Okay. So, we're going to feed the females until the end of September. And at the end of September, same as the males, like in August, I give them all a nice big meal. So for the females, at the end of September, I'm going to give them a nice big meal. Very nice. After the end of September, when I give the female a nice big meal, about one week later, I take the male, I put him into the female's home. And then I watch how they behave, okay? So, the male over here, he has something called a spur. He has little ones, but look over here. We have these little things, they're called spurs, okay? And what he will do is he will start riding all over the female. He will go hang out with her. You'll see them always together. It's so beautiful. And he'll be riding her and he'll be climbing her. And he'll be scratching her on her side and being like, hey, mommy, hey, mommy. And he's going to scratch her and rub her and be romantic with her until what ends up happening. What is going to happen then? She's going to start swelling up. She's going to be so full of love. She's going to develop these things called follicles. And the follicles is what makes it possible for them to have babies. But now you have to be careful because the woman, she's getting nice and big. She's feeling full of follicles. And then you're thinking, yay, guess what? My snake did it. He made her pregnant. Now we can take him out, but no, 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 no. That is not what you do. 
You have to wait. Because after she develops the follicles, or what is called the pre-ovulation swell, the pre-ovulation swell, okay? She's going to have that. But this does not mean she's pregnant. We have to wait, okay? Because what Ty has to do now, he has to take one of his penises, or hemipenes, and put it inside her. Yes, snakes have two penises, or hemipenes. They're hiding inside the tail, and when they get excited, they stick one out the side, okay? And then what's going to happen is something called copulation, which is sex in snake language, okay? So, he's going to wrap his tail around her tail, and you're going to see them. And if you watch them... Okay, okay, I'm back, okay. So, if you watch them, what is going to happen is the tails are going to wrap around each other like this. And if you look at them very closely, about one time every minute, mm, <laughs> that is what is going to happen. You wash your snakes, the female over here, the male, he come, he, go, he wraps himself around the female tail. And then every minute, you see a nice little, mm, there's like a pump. And what he's doing is they are having sex. And then, you know, very soon the ovulation is coming. And when the ovulation comes, that's how you know he did the job. Selkuth is my first boa. Yay. And he's never been bred. I might, I don't know, I might breed him later to some things trying to make like lighter snakes over time. But I don't know, I just haven't really had the need. He's just always been my pet and he's beautiful. Or I might just find a really nice female that hog island and make some pure hog islands. But See, the thing with locality versus uh, morph, morphs are more expensive and then their price kind of goes down. With localities, as time goes by and in the wild they become more rare, then their value goes up. When you look at these guys, they're basically, you can get them for like around $250. And to me, I don't want to go and breed a whole pile of $250 snakes. Uh, the way I look at it is I have some snakes that are more expensive and there's some cheap ones in those litters, so those are my cheaper snakes. But why do I want to go and make a whole pile of snakes to just oversaturate the market full of cheap animals? I just don't want to do it. I believe that the more you charge, the better. The more expensive the snake is, the better. Because if somebody is spending more money on the animal, chances are they're probably going to take better care of it. Now this isn't always true. There are some people that have normal boas and cheap animals and they take better care of them than people that buy fancy ones. But we're just generalizing, which is terrible, but we're doing it. We got to the copulation part. She looks swollen. We don't pull out the mail. Okay, now, if this stuff doesn't happen, so if you put the male in with the female and there's no sex happening or whatever, you can feed the female, wait, wait it for like three weeks, two weeks, put them another male in, same male, different male. Uh, if, if, you know, if it's the first time you're breeding the male, then we, you don't really know their personalities or behaviors either. Like if you have a male that's bred before, chances are he's gonna breed again. So you have to, uh, you have to figure out the animals because some animals just don't wanna breed and some do and it can be tricky. Yes, 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 yes. So now, once the female has the ovulation, so she's had the post-ovulation shed, she's had the sex, the copulation, now we have an ovulation, and the ovulation is gonna look like she swallowed a football. And you might not catch it. This is why it's important to pay attention. You pay attention, you're gonna see the ovulation. She's gonna swell up, and you're gonna be like, yes! She's ovulating! I mean, I mean, she, ovulation! And we have a party, we're like, yes, she ovulated! You invite your friends over, you get some churros, you have a party, okay? Fiesta! After she has the ovulation, you say one, two, three. Because 123 days later, you most likely will have babies, or around there. One, two, three, okay? One, two, three! Ovulation! One, two, three, ovulation, one, two, three. Okay, that's how you remember. You see that football inside her body? That is the ovulation. And now you're going to have babies around 123 days later. Yes. Okay. Now the other way, which is more common. Oh, thank you, Jeff Rohn. Jeff Rohn, he taught me that. 
Jeff Rohn is the one that said one, two, three. He's saying these things and I'm telling you, I got that from him, okay? Now, the other thing that people sometimes look at is the post-ovulation shed. So, after they have the ovulation, they will have a shed. And a hundred days after that shed, usually that shed happens 16 to 23 days after the ovulation. And then, about a hundred days after, you're going to have babies. So, either ovulation, one, two, three, which is what I like, more easy, or ovulation shed, hundred days later. Yes. I hope you enjoy this because this is going to take me forever to edit. So I hope you like it. I hope you share it and just like subscribe and all that wonderful stuff. Show it to your friends. Be like, this is the most ridiculous video I've ever seen. But it was very educational and entertaining, hopefully. So anyways, uh, we want to remember that we maintain that hot spot. Okay, we want that hot spot to be steady throughout the whole season. So... Something that I like to do is boost the heat hotspot from about 91 to 92. So have that hotspot at 92, make sure, you know, it's just a touch warmer. I'm also not dealing with like normal, like hot temperatures in the South. I'm in the winter in Canada. So the room might get a little bit colder and I'd like to have that hotspot at 92 maintained, you know, maintain it on a thermostat. Make sure your thermostat isn't turning on and off and on and off and on and off because you're just asking for problems. Use a, what's it called, a rheostat or like a dimming one, a dimming where, where the temperature is controlled, like the, the herp stats are basically the best. You put your heat on a herp stat that maintains the temperature of 92 degrees and you are set, okay? And then they're gonna go through all that time and just before they give birth, you're gonna see a waxy stool. If you wondered what a waxy poop looks like, that looks like a waxy poop. She's ready to give us babies, so hopefully tonight or tomorrow we have them. They are due on Saturday though. Behold, the waxy poo. Oh, the waxy poo. Is that an indication? Yeah. So before they give birth, they have a waxy poo. So it's a poop that looks kind of waxy, and then anywhere from a day to a week later, you're gonna have babies. And that is the way it's done. If you thought the accents were terrible, tell me. If you thought they were wonderful, tell me. If you wanna see my original German song, click on the first video. If you just wanna watch more videos about boas, click on the second video. Have a great time, have a wonderful evening, day, or whatever it is that you're having. Like, subscribe, just do it, okay? I'll see you next time.